Hey guys, welcome to another video. Today we're checking out the AMD Athlon 64 X2 6000 Plus and we're putting together a Windows XP retro gaming PC. We've got benchmarks, gameplay and I will talk about the installation process and if I ran into any issues. Now with the 6000 Plus we had a couple of versions. Originally there was a 90 nanometer Windsor Core running at 3 gigahertz with 2 megabytes of level 2 cache, but we're using the more modern 65 nanometer version with the Brisbane core. This one is clocked a little bit higher at 3.1 gigahertz and has 1 megabytes of level 2 cache. So this processor has two cores running at 3.1 gigahertz with 2 512 kilobytes of level 2 cache. We've got an 89 watt TDP. It is for socket AM2, has a DDR2 channel memory controller and was released in June of 2008 and I bought it for 16 US dollars from AliExpress. In past videos we ran into lots of issues with AMD mainboards that had the Nvidia Enforce chipset, especially boards from Asus. They seem to not be very reliable and die after all this time. So I'm using a mainboard from MSI with AMD chipsets and this time everything worked wonderfully. This board has three model numbers it seems. There's an MS7501 version 1.0 but there's also a K9A2GM. However, there was a sticker on top of that model number saying K9A2VM, and that's what I googled to find the latest motherboard BIOS. If it has a BIOS chip, we will flash it. Version 1.C is the latest one from August of 2010, and I was a little bit worried about the CPU support. The processor we're using today is not listed, but the BIOS is two years uh, more modern compared to the processor. So I thought, well, there's a high chance that it does support the CPU. It also fits the power envelope. And yes, it supported the processor without any issues. So we have an AMD 780V Northbridge and a SB700 Southbridge. Four DDR2 memory modules, PCI Express 16X and 1X, as well as two PCI slots. We've got four SATA 2 ports. There's an ID port, a floppy port, everything worked without any issues. At the back we have two PS2, VGA and DVI, four USB 2, gigabit ethernet and audio. Very nice to see is that the AM2 socket is compatible with the latest processor coolers from AMD. So we're using a 125 watt AMD cooler with a nice copper core. And of course we're using once again a graphite thermal pad instead of thermal paste. I've been starting doing this a while ago and yeah it's made my life a lot easier normal cleaning and yeah performance was brilliant for windows xp four gigabytes of ram is what i like to go with so here we have two ram modules with two gigabytes each these are tdr 2800 modules now the processor we're using today is interesting because it has an odd uh, multiplier, the memory speed will be slightly below uh, 400 megahertz. So this is not a bug. Uh, it's just the nature of this processor using a multiplier of 15.5. So if you're using any tools to read the memory clock speed, don't be alarmed. It will be a little bit below 400 megahertz. The video card we're using is the GDX 750 Ti with 2 gigabytes of video memory. I've been using this card in quite a lot of XP projects because it's terrific. The performance is outstanding and it's power efficient. This card does not require a 6-pin PCI Express power connector and it can run games at 1600 by 1200 with all the eye candy options enabled. Uh, this is a particular model from Asus and we have HDMI. DVI and VGA outputs and worked beautifully for this project. Good sound is also important. We're going with a PCI Express sound card. This is the Creative Labs Sound Blaster X5 Titanium and sounds absolutely wonderful. This will give you EAX support in a lot of games. So let's compare how our regular sound card compares with this one with EAX enabled in the game Doom 3. Welcome to Mars. All new arrivals need to check in at reception. Welcome to... Welcome to Mars. All new arrivals need to check in at reception. 
I'm using the Sound Blaster X5 Series Support Pack 4.0 drivers, which you can download from the Daniel Case official blog website. I go with the full installation and then you also need to disable CMSS 3D unless you're playing with headphones. With a lot of older mainboards, there are issues using a modern SATA SSD because they use a SATA 3 interface and a lot of older BIOS versions and chipsets have an issue with that. No such issues on this mainboard, it got detected straight away. Now installing Windows XP, there are some concerns about wear and tear, but with modern drives I don't think that's an issue. Also just don't partition the entire capacity so you have some leftover flash cells to be used for uh, garbage collection and I partitioned this on a modern Windows 10 PC, PC so the partitions are all aligned. Installing Windows XP was silky smooth. We're using once again the easy to boot project to install XP of a USB flash drive and after the installation I downloaded the latest AMD chipset drivers. We've got version 13.4 also the AMD RAID drivers version of 13.4. There are a few errors during the installation, but the drivers still installed. And then just the video card drivers, the sound card drivers are installed at RTX 9. And after that, benchmarks and games. And now let's take a closer look at the performance. We're using a 750 watt power supply from Thermal Take. Sitting idle on the desktop, I saw a reading of 66 watts. However, this processor supports cool and quiet. So you need to go into the BIOS, enable cool and quiet. You also need to change the power profile and you need to install a driver from AMD. And then the idle power consumption reduced to 46 watts. Running Far Cry at 1600 by 1200, the entire system consumed only 125 watts, which is fairly good. And now let's have a look at some benchmarks. We've got 3 Mark 2001 SE with a score of 38,692. In 03, we're getting 53,735, and in 05, 16,495. And here we have some games to look at any GPU or CPU bottleneck. In Doom 3 we can see at all resolutions we're getting the exact same score. In Far Cry with ultra details, same thing, we're getting 104 FPS. The 640 by 480 result is always a little bit lower for some reason. So once again in Far Cry also the processor being the bottleneck and not the video card. And here we have Fear with minimum average and maximum results. Here we can see that the maximum results do trend down a little bit as we increase the resolution. We can also see a similar trend with the average results, especially at 1600 by 1200. But what stands out are the minimum results with uh, around 44 to 43. This shows that at some uh, points in the game, the processor is just too weak to guarantee 60 FPS at all times. But for most of the times, uh, fear will run really fine on this machine. And now it's time to look at some games. And this time I benchmarked a wide range of games. Also a few games that we haven't checked out on the channel before. Also, I went into the NVIDIA control panel and enabled 16x and anisotropic filtering for all the games. So first here we have Doom 3. This game is capped at 60 FPS. We're running at 1600 by 1200. Looks good, performs good, so Doom 3 is a game that runs excellent on this machine. Now Far Cry, the benchmarks are telling us decent performance, but in the beginning of the game um, the area is especially demanding and a lot of uh, older processors do struggle in that aspect. But this machine holds the 60 FPS even in this demanding area. Once again, we're running at 1600 by 1200. The game looks absolutely fabulous and runs well as well. So Far Cry, uh, really enjoyable. Also, I'm using the GOG version of Far Cry in this video. Half-Life 2, this is of course the Steam version. It is DRM free. Just copy the folder across and off you go. Over 60 FPS at 1600 by 1200 with all the details maxed out. So uh, that game is a must to play for the Windows XP retro era. Uh, also episode one and episode two. Those games are also DRM free. Splinter Cell Chaos Theory. This is my favorite Splinter Cell game, 1600 by 1200. Excellent performance. Another game that this machine runs without any issues. Here we have Need for Speed Underground. 
This is the first time I'm running it at 1600 by 1200 out of the box. It's locked or limited to 1280 by 1024, but there is a mod that lets you unlock higher resolutions and yeah, looks absolutely fantastic. On this machine, it also um, uh, by default enables all the eye candy features like light trails and motion blur. On weaker machines, it seems that it will not automatically turn those on. So that's also an indicator that this processor has decent performance. It runs Halo. This is just a multiplayer map with me being the only player. 1600 by 1200, we have everything enabled. Also with the sound, I always go into the options and if there's an option to enable EAX, I will do so. Um, you get a really nice uh, sound stage in such games. Hitman 2, this is the GOG version, running at 1600 by 1200. Good looking game, um, quite difficult at times, haven't played it in a while. It's one of those games with trial and error where you just have to play the game over and over to find all the options and what you need to do. But definitely if it's on special, do pick it up. Here we have GTA San Andreas, running at over 60 FPS. Once again, 1600 by 1200. I did go into the options and I cranked up the viewing distance and all of that. So another game that runs really well. Screamer 4x4. This is an interesting game. It's not so much a racing game, uh, more about climbing hills and not, not touching obstacles. 1600 by 1200. I believe this is the OpenGL option. I tried the Direct 3D render option, but I got some artifacts. So OpenGL seems to be the way to go, especially with a NVIDIA video card. Return to Castle Wolfenstein runs at over 60 FPS. Silky smooth, 1600 by 1200, of course, and looks good and is a really fun game to play to this day. Armed and Dangerous, this is a new game. It runs too fast out of the box, so there seems to be an issue with the game engine. So we're using VSync to uh, limit it to 60 FPS. And yeah, it runs constant at that frame rate. Once again, 1600 by 1200 with all the details maxed out. And I also tested Red Faction 2. This game also runs at over 60 FPS at 1600 by 1200 with all the details maxed out. So guys, that is a nice retro gaming PC, but does it run Crisis? Let's have a look. Here we are at 1600 by 1200, and it doesn't do a too bad of a job. Now, this time I've set the details to medium, and yeah, it does run Crisis. It's not the ultimate Crisis machine, and there are still areas where it will struggle. But if that's the sort of machine you had back in the day with a decent video card and you were happy to play at medium details, maybe tweak the configuration files a little bit, yep, you could play Crisis on such a configuration. So guys, this project was enjoyable. Compared to the NVIDIA Enforce mainboards, they really put up a fight and they made my life hell. It was such a pain in the neck to work with them. And uh, four mainboards I actually threw out because uh, three of them weren't, uh, weren't even working and one was really unreliable. So thanks to the AMD chipset, uh, perfect stability, perfect compatibility with all the components here. And this was a really fun project and this is how it should be. A Windows XP retro gaming PC should just work. That's the whole point of building it. If you are having issues with an old Windows XP machine, I would just move on and swap out the parts and don't waste too much time. Time is precious. You want to enjoy either building the machine and seeing it run or playing some actual games. And yeah, so let's talk about the parts. SSD is a must for me, even with Windows XP. I'm not gonna be too fast about wear and tear. So far, all my SSDs are still working and we had perfect compatibility with the SATA 3 interface. The GDX 750 Ti is cheap. It's available for a low price. It doesn't run well under Windows 10 these days anymore. So now it has like a second uh, lease to life as a Windows XP retro gaming card. If you're looking for a comparable, maybe a slightly slower card from AMD, check out the Radeon HD 7770. That seems to be available for similar pricing. It's not quite as fast, but it's fast enough for all the games that we looked at. Decent sound is also a must. So go with a Sound Blaster X5. You can get away with using an Audi G2, for example, but if you want the EAX, uh, 5 or the EX HD 5 or whatever it's called, you need a X5 card. They are available for the PCI and the PCI Express 
bus. And my personal favorite is the Titanium 40 piece Express interface. RAM, DDR2 RAM is cheap as chips. So um, yeah, it's not gonna be an issue finding cheap RAM. And thanks to the AMD cooler, uh, AMD socket, you can use modern AMD coolers, even tower coolers if you like. I just prefer these top-down coolers because they cool the area around the CPU socket as well, looking after those capacitors um, and looking after your mainboard. And finally, the processor, excellent performance. Um, in fear was the only weakness that I saw with the minimum FPS. Now comparing the entire platform, there is of course the Core 2 platform to consider. Here the processors are even cheaper, you can get a dual core core 2 for around $10. The main boards are also cheaper around uh, yeah, $10 cheaper on average. Everything else is the same cost. So what I'm saying is if you want an AMD platform for whatever reason, maybe that's uh, what your heart tells you to do, you're looking at a premium of around $10 to $20 compared to a Socket 775 platform. The performance will be a little bit reduced. A core 2 is very powerful and will have higher average and especially higher minimum FPS. But as we've seen in the benchmarks, this processor is good enough for most Windows XP retro games and therefore I can highly recommend it. So if you see a nice AIM2 mainboard, CPU, bundle, whatever, and the price is good, don't be shy, grab it. Um, this makes a terrific Windows XP platform. And yeah, that's it for this video. I'm a happy camper, everything worked with this project, that's how it should be, that's how I like to spend my time in my lab, not fighting compatibility issues while, like with those NVIDIA chipsets. So yeah, don't go for an NVIDIA Enforce chipset with this platform, I've had too many bad experiences. You might be lucky and have a motherboard that still works, well my experiences were different, it caused me a lot of wasted days and uh, some grief. So. My heart now goes with the AMD chipsets. They worked fine for me. And this makes for a really nice Windows XP retro PC gaming platform. So as always, guys, what about you? What do you think about this project? What about AIM2? What about the Athlon 64X2? Share your memories, share your experiences. Let me know what else do you want to see on this channel. And as always, guys, this is a hobby. So at the moment, I'm doing a video maybe every two weeks or so. It's a good rhythm uh, for me to enjoy this as a hobby. This is not a job. I don't want this be to become a second job or anything like that. So I spend, um, yeah, whenever I have time, you know, I spend it in the lab. And doing a video every two weeks gives me the right balance between uh, release, re releasing regular content for you guys, but also keep keeping my... Um, yeah, mental health in check, so to speak. So yeah, guys, there you have it. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Leave any comments down below. Always eager to hear from you. I will read every single comment. You might not get a reply, but I do read every comment. Give it a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and I shall see you soon with another one.